and take your Bibles and be with me in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, <clears throat> and I will read verses 1 through 5. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? May God um, add his blessing to the reading of his word. Please take your seat. Next Sunday, we will continue in this passage in the verses 6 through 12. Uh, but this morning, that's far enough for this sermon. And so uh, having your Bibles in hand, let's be ready to turn our thoughts to the scripture and ask the Lord to guide us in our reflection this morning. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for the Holy Spirit, your gift to your church, Father. Sent to us on the authority of Jesus Christ as the victor over the grave, as the fulfiller of the law as the son of righteousness, and we thank you for giving us your Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us, to be with us even right now, so that this, as we a people are gathered together spiritually around the word of God, spiritually in prayer and praise of God through Jesus Christ, spiritually bound together by one Holy Spirit, this is a sacred event. This is not something mundane or secular that we are doing right now. This is something supernatural that we as a body of believers scattered throughout our, our city are united in one Holy Spirit and we worship you right now. We give you our blessing, Lord. We praise you. We ask for your mercy in our lives. We ask for the grace that you have given to us through Jesus Christ to continue to sustain us. And now this morning, through the word inspired by your Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Would you do so in a way that reminds us that this is a sacred event, to hear your word read and taught? Would you do so, Lord, so that our hearts and minds are bent to your will, that we would submit ourselves to Jesus Christ even now? And Father, would you do so so that our joy and our faith in you is greatly strengthened and refreshed this morning? This is what we ask for, refreshment from the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I love so much the words of the song that Kevin just sang for us a few minutes ago. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. And as Adam uh, shared with us and reminded us of that wonderful promise in Scripture, that united by faith in Jesus Christ, we as a people, we are seen by God as if we have fulfilled the law. The law that Jesus Christ came to fulfill, we are regarded by God as a people who have fulfilled that law because Jesus did it for us. God has given us such a wonderful salvation such a wonderful consolation to be reconciled to him in relationship to him through Jesus Christ. And this was the gospel that Paul and Silvanus and Timothy preached to this church in Thessalonica. As we saw in 2016, I think it was when I preached on the first letter of Thessalonians, this was a church that had been planted during times of great difficulty, times of great op op opposition and persecution. And as we've read the last couple of weeks, in our series now in 2 Thessalonians, we've seen that this church continued to grow in faith and grow in acts of love to each other in the name of Christ Jesus, even while they were suffering and being persecuted for their faith in Jesus Christ. And yet this was a church that faced 
serious challenges to their future. Do you know what the final prayer of the Bible is? The very last prayer at the end of the Bible. I was so personally encouraged this week uh, while I was uh, going through a time where I felt quite low. And I came across this in, in my Gospel Transformation Study Bible by Crossway Books. I recommend that study Bible, the Gospel Transformation Study Bible, as a way of, in your devotions, just keeping your, your heart and faith centered on Jesus Christ through all Scripture. And I came across this this week in that study Bible. The final prayer of Scripture is a prayer for this second coming. Come, Lord Jesus. Revelation 22.20 such prayer, made in the light of God's promise that our Savior will come to execute justice, to vindicate the righteous, and make the world right. Such prayer has the power to refresh and sustain us, regardless of whatever pain may wash into our lives. The Thessalonian church was in danger of losing this hope. In these verses, Paul reminds these believers of two things that will happen before Jesus comes again. But his purpose is that you and I, that we keep waiting for the day of Jesus' return, that we keep watching for these prophecies to be fulfilled, and that we keep our wits when the way is hard. So first, let's look to see how these this teaching of Paul in these four verses, these five verses, helps us to keep waiting for the day of the Lord. Verse 1 and 2 says this, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, together to him, our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word, or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So the first thing that we see in verses 1 and 2 is that Paul and Timothy and Silvanus, the, the co-writers of this letter, although scholars agree it was mainly Paul's uh, thinking and Paul's uh, uh, words that are written here for us as he uh, dictated this to uh, whoever penned it, we know that, that it was also a shared writing, that th this was written in the name of all three of the missionaries who had helped to plant this church. Nonetheless, with Paul as the lead writer, we can see that they wrote this letter to comfort this, these believers in Thessalonica, this struggling church in the Greek city of Thessalonica, to comfort them. And the coming of Christ, the coming of Christ is meant to be a comforting hope. For believers, In fact, the coming of Christ and the gathering together of his people uh, to himself, this is a core Christian belief. This is central to the Christian faith. This is one of those doctrines without which the believers cease to become Christian. They cease to be Christian in their belief. Without this doctrine, the coming of Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him. This is the the hope that theologians call our eschatological hope. That means our hope of the last things, our, our last and final hope that we look forward to. This is what we are saved for, ultimately for being regathered, reunited with Jesus Christ, gathered together to him as a body of believers, as a church from all over the world, from all generations, resurrected and reassembled to him on the day that he comes again. And this is what chapter 1, this is what this chapter, chapter 2, is all about. In fact, this is what the whole chapter is about. This is what the whole book really centers on. This is the centerpiece of the teaching of the whole book of 2 Thessalonians. And this is what Paul says in verse 1. Now, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. That's what he's on about. That's what this writing is about. And that's exactly the doctrine that was being undermined so that the hope of the Thessalonians was being threatened. The day of the Lord. It is the coming of the day of the Lord that Paul is encouraging them to keep their hopes fixed on. 
And that day of the Lord, his visible, his coming, his judgment, and the gathering, that day of the Lord and all the events that take place on that great day, is what Paul says in, at the end of verse 2, to the effect that the day of the Lord has not come, or that, that it has already come, that these believers somehow were believing that perhaps the day of the Lord had already come. But Paul wants to remind them, just as he has taught them already in chapter 1, the day of the Lord when Jesus comes again is visible. The day of the Lord when he comes again is unmistakable. The day of the Lord when Jesus comes again is a day of judgment upon the wicked and of great reward and relief for the, those who believe in him and belong to him at his coming. And so the context here in 2 Thessalonians, not just these verses in chapter 2, but the context of these verses should be what helps guide us in understanding what exactly is Paul saying about the day of the Lord. And the context to 2 Thessalonians 2, of course, starts with 2 Thessalonians 1. Look with me at the middle of verse 7 in 2 Thessalonians 1. And let's read through verse 10 to see what it says about the visible coming of Jesus Christ on that day. In the middle of verse 7, it says, When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day, to be glorified in his saints, and to be marveled at among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven, verse 7 said, that's the day of the Lord. When he comes on that day, verse 10 says, and he regathers his people to him, and, and they are glorified in him, and he is glorified in them. What a great day we are looking forward to. Believers and unbelievers will see him come and believers will be gathered to him. And that word for being gathered together to him is literally the Greek word synagogue. It will be a synagogue of believers gathered together to Christ, a physical reunion of all those who have ever believed in Jesus Christ, a physical gathering together with Jesus to be assembled to him as one group of people loving him and finally glad that he's here. That is the day of the Lord when Jesus comes back to earth. And Paul says in this letter, We ask you, brothers, don't be shaken. Don't be too quickly shaken. Not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the effect that this day of the Lord has already come. When Paul says, We, we ask you, brothers, Brothers, those who already believe in Christ, we ask you not to be quickly shaken in mind, uh, shaken in mind or alarmed. When those words shaken in mind, uh, the 14th century uh, Bible translator, John Wycliffe, he called that uh, being moved from your wit. Moved from your wit. We have the idea of being shaken in your wits. And that's what uh, Wycliffe translated this passage as. But uh, it's also the word, uh, the next word is alarmed, not to be shaken in our wits or alarmed. And that word alarmed is interesting because Jesus used that word also for, uh, to teach people about the coming of Christ, of himself. And he used that same word in Matthew 24, 6. To those who would pay attention to his teaching, he said, do not be alarmed. In Matthew 24, 6, this is what Jesus taught. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. That's the same word. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. It's possible Paul's even alluding to Jesus' own teaching when he uses this word. Do not be quickly shaken in your wits, and do not be alarmed. For these things must happen, but the end is not yet. In other words, they're saying to the Thessalonian church, don't let anyone tell you differently. Don't let anyone give you any teaching other than what we already taught you when we were with you. Don't let anyone 
convince you, even if they're using the Bible to do it, even if they seem to be sound in everything they're teaching and, and they're backing it up verse by verse from the scripture, don't let anyone undermine what we've already taught you. Don't let anyone be the source or the cause of you being quickly shaken by events that happen or alarmed and scared. That word alarmed again, it, when it's a, an active word in Greek, it means to shout or to yell with a cry of fright. But when it's passive, like it is here, it means to be startled. But like when someone says, boo, and you're scared out of your wits. Uh, and that's the word. Don't be so scared by events that happen that you jump, that it's unexpected, that you're not prepared for it. And that by doing so, your faith could be undermined. So Paul says here, even if someone proves it from the Bible, he says, as if it's from the Spirit or in a sermon, or, or teaching, or a message, as if it's by a word, or as if it's uh, in a letter that claims to be from us, a letter seeming to be from us, he says in verse 2. Because verse 5 says, if you jump ahead just a little bit, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Because verse 5, again, Paul is reminding them this is what I already taught you when I was with you, when we planted your church, those two months when I spent that time with you. Nothing should be allowed to unconvince these believers about what they had already been taught when Paul and Silvanus and Timothy were with them, and they carefully taught and preached to them. But somehow, some of these believers were being shaken by strange teaching. And the strange teaching specifically is, we don't know all the details about it, but seems to be something about the fact that the day of the Lord might already have arrived. That's what Paul says at the end of verse 2, to the effect that the day of the Lord has already come. And Dr. Kent Hughes is very helpful on this passage, and he points out that this is not as strange an idea as we might think. He says, we might find this unusual. But in the late 1800s, a pastor named Charles T. Russell taught that Christ would return invisibly in 1874 and make himself known to the world in 1914. Another leader in that movement, Judge J. F. Rutherford, explained that Russell was wrong in his calculations. Christ came back on October 1, 1914, but it was an invisible coming. coming. His coming was an invisible coming. He goes on to explain those were the beginnings of what we now know as the Jehovah's Witnesses. Today there are about eight and a half million people on earth who believe that Jesus Christ has already come, although invisibly, who claim to be Christians but are misled about the second coming of Jesus Christ. And they separate those two events that Paul encourages us here in verse 1. Now concerning the coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. They separate those two events. So they believe Jesus came invisibly, but that we haven't yet been gathered to him. But Paul wants these held together. These two events in verse 1. Our being gathered together to him. There are millions of people who believe that Christ has come invisibly. There are millions of people, though, who act like the day of the Lord has already come. Even if they don't really believe that, they live like they do. And so I think this word here is important for many of us who are evangelicals to hear. If you don't cherish the belief that the day of the Lord is coming, there is a danger that you might live like it already has come. Christians are supposed to live with one foot in the now and one foot in the not yet. When we put too much weight to one side or the other, we make a mistake of neglecting how we have been taught to live as followers of Christ. When we live too much with one foot on weighted on, on the not yet, on the future, on the second coming of Jesus, we're in danger of having an over-realized eschatology as if he's already come. I read a blog this week that, that really helped me to think through what are some of the dangers that come from having too much assumption that this is what we're called to live for, that this is the world we live in, to, to act like Jesus Christ has already come, to have an over-realized eschatology. And one of the things that, that stood out to me was, first, we might have a hard time accepting the things that go along 
with a world that's been damaged and cursed by sin. Damaged by things like disease and death and disappointment. The whole world, as we know from the Bible, the whole world has been under the curse of sin since Adam's sin at the beginning. And yes, Jesus saves us from sin's penalty, but that doesn't change our bodies now. That doesn't change the world we live in yet. That day is not now. That day is not yet. The second thing that that could possibly affect us if we live like too much acting like Jesus has already come with an over-realized eschatology is we might make a mistake about Jesus being our great physician. Yes, he is our great physician. He is the healer. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. He will give us every victory in time. But sometimes we can't understand why God won't heal when we pray for deliverance from cancer or COVID-19 or some other malady that plagues us right now. He has promised he will deliver us from sickness one day, but that day is not now. That day is not yet. And third, when we're born again, God does give us a new nature, but some people get in their heads this idea that with a new nature, being born again, we're supposed to be able to just simply stop sinning altogether. And that person who believes he should have a complete victory over all sin in his life already is in danger of becoming depressed and discouraged when he finds he just can't live up to that. He will think that Maybe his failures mean that he's not really a Christian. Even though Paul in Romans 7 talked about his own battle with sin and his own struggles to continue to fight against sin, a struggle that often seemed discouraging. Even though John wrote that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth of God is not in us in 1 John chapter 1. But John goes on to say, my little children, in 1 John 2, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We will be freed one day from sin. And I can hardly wait. We will be freed one day from sin from the presence of sin, from the reality of temptation, from our own failure. We will be freed one day from our own weaknesses. But that day is not now. It is not yet. Fourth, sometimes that we as Christians, I think we, we think we have, might have failed if we can't get the government to stop things like abortion or to stop things like like what they teach the kids in schools about, you know, human sexuality and gender. Or if we, if we can't, you know, um, make the government do things and handle things in a biblical way, that maybe we failed as Christians. Maybe that's our task, is to reform the government, to convert the government, to make it a Christian land. Sometimes I think we as Christians, we get frustrated and we feel maybe we failed if we, we just can't put up with how the government decides to handle emergencies like COVID-19. But though Christ is king, this isn't his kingdom yet. Though Christ is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and though he does rule from the right hand of God the Father, we can see that his rule is not complete yet. We can see that even now his will is not being done on earth like it is in heaven. And it's not our job to make it so. It's not our job to forcibly convert our country to Christ. Christ is king, but this isn't his kingdom yet. We, we cannot, we must not expect earth to be like heaven until Jesus comes again. To paraphrase the theologian David Lee Roth, this is not just like living in paradise. That day is not now. That day is not yet. 
So we are called as believers to live like the day of the Lord is still future, because it is. The day of the Lord, as verse 2 says, has not yet arrived. So guard yourself against living mainly for the now. And next, Paul unpacks two predictions that are meant to help us, to meant to comfort us and to sustain us, to keep waiting for the day of the Lord. The next point is that Paul helps us to see that we need to keep watching for the prophecies to be fulfilled. Look with me at verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. And Paul already told them these things. He had already taught them these things. As verse 5 reminds us, and skip ahead once again to verse 5, just so we can see, this is not a brand new teaching. In verse 5, Paul said, Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? The things that he's just been explaining in verses 1 through 4. Paul had taught them these things during his time in Thessalonica. So Paul has already taught them about two major events that must happen before Jesus comes back again. Two events that must happen first, says verse 3. Neither of which had happened yet when this letter was written in around the year 50 AD. First, Paul says there's going to be an apostasy. And then second, the Antichrist, predicted long ago, would be re revealed, unveiled. And I'm not going to go past verse 5 today. So I, I'm going to leave a bunch of questions that you might have. I'm going to leave a bunch of your questions unanswered. And hopefully I'll be able to address them next week. But the first prophetic event that Paul says you must watch for is what he calls in, in our translation, the rebellion. In verse 3, the rebellion. And the Greek word translated rebellion here is the Greek word apostasia, which sounds just like our word apostasy. And it means the same thing. And some people think that this is going to be a global, sort of worldwide political rebellion against God. But the word itself, the way it's used in the Bible, in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament, this word apostasia, the way it's used, is used for a falling away, a turning aside from what is considered to be biblical faith. For example, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, we read this. Have you not brought this upon yourself for forsaking the Lord your God when he led you in the way? And now what do you do by gaining, by going, what do you gain by going to Egypt and drink to drink the waters of the Nile? Or what do you gain by going to Assyria to drink the waters of the Euphrates? That is to put their hope in, in the protection of those two empires. Verse 19 of Jeremiah 2. Your evil will chastise you and your apostasy, there's the same word here, your apostasy will reprove you. Know and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God. The fear of me is not in you, declares the Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah 2, 17-19. This is a noun in verse 3, the word apostasy. It's a thing. But Jesus used this word apostasy in the verb form of the word apostatize, in the parable of the sower, one that we're very familiar with. And he said this, And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, they receive it with joy. But these have no roots. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, they fall away. There's that verb word, apostatize. Luke 8, verse 13. And then Paul used this word also in a letter to Timothy. In a prediction like this one, in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, he said, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart. That's the word apostatize from the faith. And then the book of Hebrews uses it as if we needed more evidence. But the book of Hebrews uses it in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there, be any of you, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. And there's that word again, to apostatize. The apostasy here in 2 Thessalonians verse 3. The apostasy predicts a widespread turning away of so-called Christians from true faith in Jesus Christ. That's the way the word is always used in the New Testament. And the second event 
that had had to happen before the day of the Lord is the appearance of Antichrist. Now, that's not the word that Paul uses here. He doesn't use the word Antichrist in any of his writings, but that this is the name that we've given to the, the person, the, the being that he's talking about here. Paul uses here two, I think, really colorful um, expressions, two colorful references to describe Antichrist. And these colorful graphic references leave no doubt in Paul, uh, for us that, that in Paul's mind, this Antichrist is going to be an apostate, hypocritical Christian leader. It's common, it's common knowledge that Paul here in verse 3 is comparing Antichrist to Judas when he uses the phrase, the son of destruction, because Jesus used that phrase about Judas, as we'll see in a minute. But what's less common and less understood is something that I only learned recently as I was looking at a commentary on this, a commentary by the scholar F.F. F. Bruce. And he pointed out that the phrase man of lawlessness in verse 3 is also a well-known expression that refers to a, a, a historical reference in the Bible. It's another biblical historical comparison. And I believe he's right. So here Paul makes two comparisons to help us picture what the Antichrist will be like who he will be. First, we, while well, we see two things, the Antichrist will be a Sheba and a Judas. And that's the double point Paul makes with the two names that he gives the Antichrist in the second part of verse 3. Let's look at that verse again. And the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. Two comparisons. The first, man of lawlessness. It, it comes from a Hebrew expression, uh, which is sort of the, the a man of Belial. It's a Hebrew word. A, a man of Belial, it, me, it means a, a worthless or unlawful person. And Second Samuel chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, calls a man named Sheba a man of Belial or man of unlawfulness. Look with me at Second Samuel chapter 20, verses 1 and 2. This is happening in the life of King David, right after King David has been delivered from Absalom's treachery and the kingdom, although nearly split by civil war, has been now is now being reunified, and David's on his way back to his capital in Jerusalem. And it says, Now there happened to be there a worthless man, that's that word man of unlawfulness or man of Belial, whose name was Sheba, the son of Bikri, a Benjamite, and he blew the trumpet and said, We have no portion in David, we have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his own tents, O Israel. So all the men of Israel withdrew from David and followed Sheba, the son of Bichri. But the men of Judah followed their king steadfastly from the Jordan to Jerusalem. Even while King David is returning to his capital, after suffering the loss of his son and so much tragedy, Sheba led an unlawful rebellion against the lawful king, against his rightful king. Most of the country followed him, but it says that the men of Judah stayed with David. The second colorful uh, comparison description of Antichrist doesn't just picture him rebelling against his lawful king, although he does that. The second comparison shows that he is an apostate follower of Jesus. Look with me at, at John chapter 17, uh, verse 11, right in the middle of the verse, John chapter 17. Jesus prays this, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Jesus here prays for his disciples, prays for those who have been following him for those three years, and he acknowledges that only one has been lost, the son of destruction, that is Judas. And so Jesus, is he's praying for Judas and calls him the son of destruction. When Paul also calls the Antichrist the son of destruction, it doesn't mean that the Antichrist is Judas. It means that the Antichrist is like Judas. And in this way, he is one that seemed to be a follower of Christ, but one that falls away and is lost in the end. And that's the foreview that Paul gives us of the Antichrist. 
He is a Sheba and he's a Judas. He is someone who is trying to divide the kingdom of Christ and usurp the place of Christ, and he's one who, who seemed to be at first a follower of Jesus. A Sheba and a Judas, a kingdom usurper and an apostate follower of Jesus. As I was thinking about this, I thought many of us will wonder, how can we be sure that we won't fall away from Jesus? How do we know that we won't turn apostate in time? See, falling away, as we've seen, is falling away from the true faith. Falling away is falling away from faith in Jesus. And it's important that our doctrine be correct, that our teachings and our understandings about the Bible be sound and right. But that's not primarily what falling away is falling away from. Primarily, falling away is falling away from personal loyalty, personal affection, and personal dependence upon Jesus Christ. We call that faith in Jesus Christ. So the way that you can keep on making sure that you're not going to fall away is by keeping on believing in the gospel, in the good news, from keeping on confessing your sin and keeping on daily repenting of your sin and keeping on daily trusting in the forgiveness that Jesus promised to you. Faith in Jesus It keeps us looking forward. It keeps us looking ahead to his coming, to his return, not with fear of his judgment, but with a delight and gladness and joy in our hearts at being able to be with him, to be present with him, to to hold him and hug him and love him and worship him in person. Faith in Jesus looks forward to his coming because he's the one who died for us and was raised for us. He's the one who loves us and has purchased our forgiveness, has bought our salvation, who represents us even now before his Father. He's our advocate. He's the advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, the one who loves us and loved us with his own life. So we look forward to his coming as we keep on believing in him. And we look forward to him with hope and trust that's personal because it's hope that's invested in him as a person, not merely in facts and doctrines and teachings. Also in those things, but mainly in him, centered in a personal relationship out of love and worship for him as the son of God who loved us and gave his own life for us. So falling away from Jesus is to become disloyal to him. How do we keep from falling away, falling away from Jesus? We keep on loving him, trusting him, learning more about him, and depending on him. Verse 1 says that he is coming, the coming of our Lord and our being gathered together to him. That is our Christian hope. See, we can become too quickly shaken in our minds or too alarmed in our hearts at the events happening around us, if we're not keeping, if we're not continuing to make sure to keep on making sure that we are waiting for the day of the Lord, and if we're not continuing and keeping to watch for the prophecy is being fulfilled. But if your hope is regularly refreshed by the by the the core doctrine that Paul is focused on here in verse 1, the coming of our Lord and our being gathered to him. Notice how he uses the word our, the coming of our Lord. If your hope is regularly refreshed by this core doctrine, it will help you to keep your wits. This is my final point, to keep your wits when the way is hard. Look with me at verses 4 and 5. This is the man of lawlessness, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do not remember that when I was still with you, I taught you these things. I taught you these things, Paul says. He's now made two points. Two points under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, two predictions about the apostasy and the Antichrist, two events that must happen before Jesus comes again, before that day of the Lord and the visible return of Christ to gather his people together with him. And the Holy Spirit is giving the people, the followers of Christ in Thessalonica, exactly what they need 
so that they're not going to be too easily shaken in mind or too alarmed by the things that they see happen in the world. As John Wycliffe put it, to keep their wits. And you also need to notice here that the things that Paul is predicting were not brand new prophecies. That's why verse 5 is significant here. Remember I told you these things when I was with you. Acts 17 tells us about the planting of this church in Thessalonica when Paul and Silvanus and Timothy were there. In Acts 17, it says that Paul reasoned with them from the scriptures. He taught them the Bible as in the time that he had. He preached to them as a Bible preacher and a Bible teacher, and he taught them from the scriptures. And the Bible they had at that time was what now we call the Old Testament, which means that some of the time at least, when Paul had told them these things, as verse 5 says, that it means that he'd been teaching them from the Old Testament prophecies because he'd already taught them about this. In verse 4, Paul reminds them of what he had previously taught them and he gives them just two very brief descriptions of what the Old Testament predicted Antichrist would do. Look with me at verse 4. He opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Verse 4 is, it's tough. But verse 4 is a modified quotation from Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. If you compare those verses, you see how close it is in, in many of its points. But the previous verses in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 11, which I, I preached on back in 2017, I think it was. So you can go back and look at those uh, sermons. But the previous verses up until Daniel chapter 11, verse 35, were uh, finally at the end of those verses were about the last of the Greek tyrants, the tyrants of the Greek empire, who had been uh, a severe persecutor of the Jewish people. But many scholars believe that with verse 36, the one that's quoted here in verse 4, with verse 36, there's a, a, a change. There's a shift and a transition of power here being predicted. So that it's predicting now a new superpower after the Greek empire. And Calvin, John Calvin, makes a persuasive case in his commentary on this, that this is about the rise of the Roman Empire and its rule over Jerusalem and the Jewish people. And then there's a, a, pre, a premillennial Puritan scholar uh, named Thomas Brightman who wrote a whole commentary just on these verses. And uh, he showed that it was the rulers of the Roman Empire who elevated themselves as kings with unprecedented authority. Did you know, for example, that the first of the Roman emperors, the first uh, leader of Rome to really be titled emperor and to deserve that title, uh, Caesar Augustus, he also became the supreme priest of the Roman religion. He became what they called Pontifex Maximus. And it seems then in verse 4, where Paul says this, He opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship. It seems that Paul is predicting that the Antichrist would one day follow in the footsteps of the priest kings of Rome. Next, Paul borrows from more recent events to finish the picture, to, to paint a, a full picture in, in colors that must have been as disturbing as they are graphic. Looking at verse 4 again, he opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. For Christians and for Jews, this was pretty fresh at the time this letter was written. About 10 years before this letter uh, was written, in about the year 50 AD, Gaius Julius Caesar, whom we call Caligula, he renovated the temple in Jerusalem as a temple to his own ego. He made it the temple of illustrious Gaius the New Jupiter, as the Jewish writer Philo tells us. He made himself God in the temple of God in Jerusalem, a God named the New Jupiter. But Paul, however, is not talking about Gaius Julius Caesar. Paul here is talking about a future Antichrist. He's just using this picture as a comparison, just like he has with Sheba and Judas, just like he has with the rise of the Roman emperors in Daniel 11 verse 36. 
He's talking about the future Antichrist, that he would follow in the footsteps of the Roman emperors, but that he would also be a priest to God, even act as if he is God, like Gaius did, like Caligula did, and rule over the church of Jesus Christ. None of that had happened yet when Paul wrote this letter, which meant that as these Thessalonian Christians were being told to wait for the coming of Jesus, Paul is showing them that the road ahead is going to be long and hard. They didn't know how long it would be before Jesus would come back. And still today, we don't know. But they were taught by the Holy Spirit who penned, who gave these words through the pen of the Apostle Paul. They were taught by the Holy Spirit to count on the promise he is coming again. Verse 1, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, don't be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, as if he's already come. Hang on to this promise that he's coming again, and that at that time we'll be gathered together to him. They were taught by the Holy Spirit to hang on to and count on that promise of the coming of Jesus Christ. And they were prepared by the Holy Spirit in these scriptures to endure a long, hard road as we wait for him to come. And we're prepared also by these very scriptures. We're prepared, you and I, so that we too will not be too quickly shaken or too alarmed by events that we see happening in the world around us. We keep waiting because of these scriptures. As we listen to them and as we take them to heart, we keep waiting for the day of the Lord. We keep watching for these prophecies to be fulfilled. And we keep our wits when the way is hard. Why? Isn't it because we believe in the Lord who is coming? Isn't it because we believe in his coming and we believe with hope and anticipation that we will be gathered together to our Lord. Isn't that why we look forward with confidence, even through hard times and a long road? I know that there are Christians who fit a sort of cartoonish description of, of having their noses buried in Bible prophecy and their head in the clouds and both feet in heaven. But believers should have one foot in the now and one foot in the not yet. Believers should live in the tension between the present and the future coming of Christ. And this has been the hope that empowers endurance among the followers of Christ and has done so for 2,000 years. In 1812, a missionary named Henry Martin He was translating the New Testament for the people of Persia, today the people of Iran. And he knew he he could die. He knew that his life was in some danger. But he kept working because he knew that he would not die as long as Jesus still had work for him to do. About 10 months before his death, he wrote this in his journal before he died of the plague. He wrote this, To all appearance... The present year will be more perilous than any I have seen. But if I live to complete the Persian New Testament, my life after that will be of less importance. But whether life or death be mine, may Christ be magnified in me. If he has work for me to do, I cannot die. Ten months later, the day before he died, this is what he wrote in his journal. Oh, When shall time give place to eternity? When shall appear that new heaven and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness? That is our Christian hope. That is the hope that gives strength to our minds and and to our hearts so that we're not quickly or easily shaken. This is the hope that gives strength to our hands and to our feet so that we serve our Lord until he comes, every day until he comes, no matter how long his delay seems to be, until otherwise he calls us home. That is our Christian hope. 
And as the last prayer of the Bible says in Revelation, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, would you now use these scriptures as we're rebuked for often living as if the day of the Lord has come and not putting enough weight on the promises of the future, the promise of the coming of our King, the promises of all that he has purchased for us that will be delivered finally to us on the day of his return, the promises of resurrection, of sinless glory, of strength and perfection, the promises of hope that will never, ever, ever be disappointed again, the promises that one day every tear will be dried from our eyes and there will be no more sorrow in our hearts, the promises that one day it will all be worth it when Jesus comes again. Thank you for this reminder, Lord, and help us to live like that is true because it is true. It is your word. Help us to be useful in the now, that our hearts and minds would not be too shaken or too alarmed by what happens around us or by teachings that seem to contradict the plain teaching of your scripture. We ask, Father, that you would keep our hands strong and our feet ready to serve you, to go where you would lead us, that we would be servants who are found serving our master well on the day that he returns. And we ask you, Lord, that as we watch for your word to be fulfilled, for these prophecies predicted in the scripture to happen, that you will not allow us to be so shaken by them that we tremble in fear, but that, Lord, we lift up our heads when we see these happening. We lift up our heads willing to suffer if need be for the sake of Christ, and we lift up our heads looking at the horizon, looking in hope for the dawn of our great Savior, the arrival of his coming. Lord, would you let us be planted firmly now, with feet in both worlds, in the now and in the not yet, as we follow Jesus Christ faithfully until he comes again, but as we wait for him to come with hope in our hearts. And we ask that you would do this for your people by the power of your Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.